Hello, and welcome to, Sunday at Bear Branch. A virtual ministry, of the Churches of Christ. There's a church in the valley by the wildwood, no love your place in the dale. No spot is so dear to my childhood, as the little brown church in the vale. Oh, come, 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 come to the church in the wall. Come, 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 come to the church in the vale. No spot is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the vale. Oh, come to the church in the wildwood, to the trees where the wildflowers bloom, where the parting hymn will be chanted, we will weep by the side of the tomb. Come, 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 come to the church in the wall. Come, 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 come to the church in the vale. No spot is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the vale. How sweet on a clear Sunday morning to list to the clear ringing bell. Its tones so sweetly are calling, Oh, come to the church in the veil. Oh, come, 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 come to the church in the come, 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 come to the church in the veil. No spot is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the veil. From the church in the valley by the wildwood, when day fades away into night, I would fain from the spot of my childhood wing my way to the mansions of light. Oh, come, 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 come to the church in the Come, 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 come to the church in the vale. Come, 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 no spot is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the vale. This morning we want to uh, look for a few moments. We're going to start in the book of Acts, chapter 17. We want to talk about the fact that sometimes the things that have been written or said of you may not always reflect who you are to the fullest extent. We've been talking about, uh, in the book of James, as we've been studying there, uh, our inward person and adapting and changing what people see on the outside versus uh, what's on the inside. Everyone is a unique creature before God. If you ask, someone's opinion about a particular preacher or a particular church or whatever the circumstance might be, uh, it is likely that you're going to get more than one answer. And those answers may sometimes appear to contradict one another. What is said by one is not necessarily what everyone is going to say. 
And of course, if you ask people right now, today, who's going to be the next president of the United States, I guarantee you're going to get more than one answer on that one because you're going to get a lot of perspectives when it comes to that. In keeping with that thought or that idea, in the book of Acts chapter 17, in the early part, we read about Paul's interaction with those who are in the city of Thessalonica. In verse 1, beginning there, it says, Now when they had passed through Amphil and Phil Paulus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Now, for three Sabbath days in the synagogue there at Thessalonica, the Apostle Paul requested various scrolls containing the writings of the prophets be brought to him because we're told that he opened those scrolls. Opening the scriptures, opening the scrolls, he read from the various prophets for three Sabbath days, trying to, as Jesus did with his disciples in Luke 24, open their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. How that it behooved Christ to suffer, to die, to be buried and raised again on the third day. And we tell people as, as often as we discuss it that there are about 300 to 350 prophecies in the Old Testament about Christ. So he had plenty of things to work with on those three Sabbaths. And so as the case was, he was opening the Scriptures and it was his uh, opinion. It was his teaching. He was alleging that the things that had transpired with Christ were prophesied of in the Scriptures and Jesus whom He preached was the fulfillment of those things. And, as the case is, we see in verse 4, some of them believe. Some of them believed after having those Scriptures presented and discussing those Scriptures and comparing those Scriptures with the life of Jesus, some of those in listening and considering believe that, you know, Jesus... I mean, the things that happened with this Jesus seems to be a fulfillment of the... I mean, it, it all fits together. One of the things that people tell us in understanding and looking at those prophecies concerning Jesus, the suffering Savior in the Scriptures, it would be almost impossible for anyone to fulfill those Scriptures other than the one of whom it is intended. To get one person in their lifetime to be able to line up all of those prophecies and be able to somehow manipulate the events even after their death so as to fulfill that would be extremely 
uh, difficult, if not impossible. And so as they considered Jesus, the Scripture says this, Jesus uh, was that, did that. The Scripture said Jesus was, did. The Scripture says Jesus was, did. Uh, he went through all of that. And as He went through the various prophets, some of those scrolls are, are some of the writings and some of the scrolls are relatively short. Some are longer. And so we can almost see Him rolling up a scroll and saying, now would you bring me this? And they bring Him that and it, scroll and He opens that scroll up and He begins. And after He discusses that, He rolls that scroll up and says, would you now bring me this? And so He does that for three Sabbaths. And I doubt that uh, it was a one hour service. I mean, as a Jew, you didn't have anywhere to go or anything really to do on the Sabbath. The women weren't supposed to be cooking. They weren't supposed to be working. They weren't supposed to be building a fire. They weren't supposed to be stoking a fire. And, and so it's not like you had somewhere that you were in a hurry to go to. And so Paul had the opportunity for three Sabbath days to request to open, to read, to explain. Jesus did this. This is what this says. Jesus did this. This is what it says. Jesus did this. This is what it said. Jesus did this. And then after a period of time, you kind of get to the point where you ask that question, what do you think? I mean, now that we've been doing this for three Sabbath days, what do you think? Now, everything seems to have been going all right until you kind of get to the point where, you know, you, you have to start thinking about how am I going to accept, reject, process? How, how am I going to handle this and so it's as if even if he didn't say it he fi they finally got to a point what do you think and so we're told that some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas you know some of those who were believing uh, even after the uh, synagogue worship was over, followed Paul and Silas, and they were engaging them, interacting with them, perhaps asking more questions, seeking better clarification. And then we're told of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. Now, the devout Greeks are what some people today might call the righteous Gentiles. They were Gentiles who had not converted to Judaism, but they came to the synagogue to hear the teachings of Moses and they made application of those things to their lives. This is the type of man that Cornelius was. He was a Gentile, but he was a man who had, uh, had a great desire to hear, know, and understand the things of Moses. And so there were the Jews. Some of the Jews believed and a great number, multitude of the Gentiles having heard the Scriptures and heard about Jesus and they were easily, uh, more easily perhaps persuaded because they didn't have the same customs and the same in-depth history that some of the Jews had. Some of them perhaps for the first time was coming to know the things of Moses and the law and seeing now that 
the law was pointing to this man Jesus, many of the Greeks began to believe also. And the chief women of the city. Never underestimate the fact that even though women may not preach and they may not uh, publicly teach, there are many devout women who are the backbone of the worship and service of God, who do things that others sometimes can't. They provide funding that others can't. And so these devout women, uh, perhaps women of uh, reputation in the city, they also were beginning to accept the things which Paul was teaching. But, there's always one, isn't there? Verse 5, but the Jews which believed not moved with envy. We're back to the same thing that happened with Jesus. Pilate understood that for envy, they had delivered Jesus to him. Jealousy. You know, here we've been meeting in the synagogue at Thessalonica, and we've got these Gentiles interested in the things of Moses. We've got these devout women who are coming. And devout women, if they tithe right, you know, that works out pretty good uh, if they have possessions and all. So they've got, you know, everything's been going as far as they see it. They've, they've been listening to the rabbi and to the various teachers in the synagogue. And, and in their life, everything was going perfect until Paul and Silas shows up. And now, people are being asked to question and accept something more than the status quo. To go through more than just what we do every Sabbath day. You know, something new has been introduced to the mix. Some new individuals, Paul, Silas, and some of his companions are there. And so with this division, and all of a sudden, you know, we have to understand that we think of Paul as an apostle uh, of the church, but his qualifications would have made him a rabbi in the Jewish world. Uh, being brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, who was a doctor of the law, being instructed as a Pharisee in the traditions and customs would have put him in a position where uh, he would have been easily accepted among the Jewish people as a rabbi. Uh, even though we don't generally see anybody calling him a rabbi, they talk about Paul or they talk about uh, the Apostle Paul. But uh, that status as a teacher among the Jewish people with this new insight caused many people to start following these newcomers. You know, we, we allowed them into the synagogue. We allowed them to, to speak. And then these Jews that did not believe and there's a good likelihood that those would probably be some of the leaders of the synagogue because uh, they had the most to lose, we'll use that term, uh, by people wanting to change or transition from uh, the status quo into this new uh, gospel, this new message that this a traveling rabbi and his companions has brought to our city. And so we're told that uh, they took unto them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort. I don't know. They went down to the shadier part of town. That's what we're talking about. Got some mean and ornery fellers that'll do just about anything for uh, five dollars and a swig, 
You know, you can pretty much find individuals of the baser sort. They're not, uh, they're, they're not burdened down with conscience, if you understand. You know, we, we sleep well at night no matter what we do. And so uh, we're, we're willing to do anything as long as the money's good and the liquor's flow. And that's just kind of the fellers that they were. So they went and got these individuals and they gathered a company. Uh, They got together a bunch of good old boys, as we would think of it, and uh, set all the city on an uproar. What was a matter of the synagogue, which should have been kept in the synagogue, now has been turned into an uproar that encompasses the whole city. And of course, that's done for envy, not because uh, they necessarily believe that... Here's the thing, not they necessarily believe that what they were saying were not exactly correct, but it had to do with envy. It had to do with pride. It had to do with them taking our people. You know, all these people are searching out Paul instead of searching out us. And so we're told that they assaulted the house of Jason, which seemed to be where uh, Paul and Silas had been staying. Uh, This crowd of misfits, uh, they attacked the house of Jason Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Um, in the old West, we'd have called this probably a lynch mob. You know, we're not interested in truth, we're just interested in a good hanging. And so we've already decided that they need hung, whether they you think they do or not. I mean, that's the kind of situation that we had. And when they found them not, that is, they uh, couldn't find Paul and Silas there at Jason's, they drew him and certain of the brethren which were there unto the rulers of the city. Now, not to the rulers of the synagogue, but to the rulers of the city. And their cry was, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. And so these christian people who have caused problems everywhere else they've been, they've turned the whole world upside down. I, I think that they were trying to turn an upside down world right side up. But either way, the world was getting flipped for somebody. Here we are again. There's two opinions. They believe that Paul and Silas had come to turn the world upside down. Paul and Silas believed they came to turn the world right side up and get things back the way that they were supposed to be. And so they came here, and this man, this man right here, they call Jason, he's a ringleader in this whole mess. He kept him. Uh, Jason received these individuals And their accusation is that they do things contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And so this this is, in a way, some of the things that the Jewish leaders did with Jesus before Pilate that these individuals who are staying in Jason's house, they've came here, turned the city upside down, and you know what? They're teaching that there's another king besides Caesar. Now you know that's going to get the attention of the Roman government and those associated with that. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. You know, Caesar hears that there's uh, this bunch of people who are teaching that uh, there's another king besides Caesar. Uh, He could send in troops and everything else and 
as the Jewish leaders did before, these Roman officials, you know, Rome could take away their place and their city. They may not have necessarily had a nation, but they had a city and uh, hold them accountable for that. And when they had taken security of Jason and the other, they let them go. When they had taken the payment. You know, how much money you got on you? And so when Jason and the other who was with him uh, came up with what today we think of as bail money. I'm not sure it went to bail money, but they took security so he didn't run off. You know, they, they took promise that he would show up if court was necessary, and they took security of him. And because of this chaos, verse 10, it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, whose coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews once again, because this is the manner, the custom that Paul had. This was his starting point if there were a synagogue or Jews assembling. And then we find this statement in verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greek, and of men, not a few. And so uh, we find the uh, account of Brother Luke in the church at Thessalonica and the coming of Paul and Silas into the city of Berea. Now as we look at these two verses or these two churches or synagogue of people, we have more time devoted to Thessalonica than to Berea, and we're left with the idea that the church at Berea was a wonderful church. The people in the city of Berea were wonderful people, but Thessalonica is less noble. I mean, they're, they're just a bad seed. And if this is all that we had, we would be left to believe that Thessalonica was a terrible city and that perhaps the church at Thessalonica was not that good of a church. And depending on who you ask about the church at Thessalonica, you can see that you're going to get a difference of opinion. If you ask the rulers of the city at Thessalonica, what do you think about these people? They would have probably said they're a scary bunch. I hear they're trying to overthrow Caesar. If you ask the rulers of the synagogue what they thought about this group of individuals that once worshipped with them, they would have probably told you, well, they're rebels and they're teaching things that are contrary to the law of Moses and teaching the people to do things which uh, we are forbidden to do. And of course, if you ask the church at Thessalonica, they would have had a completely different opinion that we were so glad that Paul and Silas came to their city and preached and taught there. So you, you could easily get three different opinions about the church at Thessalonica from the groups that we have uh, been looking at. Of course, if you talk to the good old boys, they'd probably shirk their shoulder and say, I don't know, don't care. didn't matter anyway. It wasn't something that they were, were interested in at all. So we could have maybe four different sets of opinions. 
But as we read, we, we get the idea that the people of Berea were a more noble people, which tends to shine a, a poor light upon the church at Thessalonica. When we hear things like these were more noble than those of Thessalonica, you know, we, we automatically, even though we have less verses dealing with the church at Berea, we're led to believe that the things of Berea were just a wonderful place. And when we look in the Scriptures, we find that there's no letter to the church of Berea. We don't find any letters written to the church of Berea from the Apostle Paul. Now, there's perhaps many reasons for that. I mean, if the church and the people there at Berea uh, followed the law of Christ, uh, there wouldn't have been a great deal of reason for the Apostle Paul to write. It seems like many of his letters were written uh, at places where there were difficulties, troubles, or whatever else. And so... But just left to that, if that's all we ever had, uh, we would believe that Berea was a great church. Thessalonica was kind of on the fringe. But the Apostle Paul wrote two specific letters to the church at Thessalonica. Uh, and listen uh, to, to some of the things, and I'm not going to spend a great deal of time with this, but I, I want us to... Look at First Thessalonians, uh, and we're going to begin verse 5 of the first chapter. Paul says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. That means that while Paul was there, those three Sabbaths reasoning with them in the synagogue, he apparently was also performing miracles and confirming things through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, that they were doing that in power and in the Holy Ghost. The idea of that is, is that to confirm the things that was being taught, uh, they were performing some kind of miracles, perhaps healing the sick, whatever that was going on. And in much assurance, as you know, what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you become believers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And we might be led to believe that the church at Thessalonica was uh, less noble, even though it's talking more about the the people and the religious leaders and all of that, but they became followers. They became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. And so that means that even in the face of affliction, the people at Thessalonica went ahead believing the truth and accepted and acted upon it. And so that tells us right off that those who were Christians at Thessalonica, they weren't the people that were less noble. These individuals were accepting the truth even in the face of that uh, mob of individuals, even though Jason's house was perhaps ransacked looking for Paul and they couldn't find him. And even though they took uh, bribes or surety uh, of Jason and those were there, so that ye were examples or examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. When I just don't seem on the surface reading Acts 17 that these people would have been accepted as examples in, Macedo uh, in the area of, of Macedonia and Achaia, where in was Greece and Philippi and all these different places, Corinth. It says, But also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. That's interesting. You know, when we get the account from Luke 17, we if that was all that we had, we would probably end up with a bad 
uh, taste about Thessalonica and whatever church was established there. But Paul says this church became an example to them, not just in Thessalonica, but Macedonia, Achaia, and that the truth of who they were, the people they were, their faithfulness had spread throughout all these regions so much, Paul says, I don't even need to write about it. Hmm. See what happens when you ask for one person's opinion or you only look at one side of an issue you know, they always say that there's this side and that side and somewhere in the middle is the truth. And if we're not careful, we'll miss the truth because we're being persuaded by something that causes us to lean uh, to one side or the other. Uh, and sometimes that may be the case that there is right, wrong. But sometimes people view things and look at things a whole lot differently. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now this would seem to be speaking more to the righteous Gentiles, the Greeks that were there. But they made a commitment to abandon their idols and the Jewish people accepted Jesus that were part of the church. And they were serving the living and true God. And they were waiting, we're told, for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from wrath to come. We can read the rest of First Thessalonians. We can read Second Thessalonians. It wasn't without some issues that the Apostle Paul had to address. But in reading First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, when we ask Paul, what do you think? Luke wrote one thing. Never, Luke's not wrong. He wrote from his perspective and he didn't have time in talking about Paul's various journeys to go into great details. But if you took Luke's account and that only, and then you took Paul's account, it would seem that, well, you know, Luke and Paul seems to have differences of opinions as to what the church at Thessalonica Thessalonia, Thessalonica was like. But when you put the two parts together, you get a very clear picture of a city which did not easily embrace the things of Jesus, but there was a church that came out of both Jews and Gentiles that became a church that set an example of being faithful to God even in the face of persecution and suffering. And so we, as always, need to search the Scriptures, study the Scriptures. Sometimes people, when they're studying the Scriptures, read a verse, and sometimes that verse is taken out of context and sometimes it's not considered in light of other verses. And that one verse out of context by itself uh, is used to teach something that the rest of the Bible uh, doesn't teach. John 3.16 is one of those. It's a beautiful verse. It needs to be kept in context of Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. A lot of times it's so separated from where it came from that people don't understand that that's part of the lesson that Jesus was speaking with Nicodemus about. Many people believe that faith only is all that we need. If we believe in Jesus, John 3.16 says, if we believe in Jesus, we'll be saved. We don't need anything else. Well, there's a whole New Testament that has a lot of other things to say. 
Just like if you read 1 Thessalonians, you think the church at Thessalonica was a great congregation. If you read Luke's account, you may have questions about who they were. But when you read the whole thing, get all the truth, you find just that, the truth. So when it says study to show yourself approved, it means to really study. You have to look at the whole story. You have to do, as Paul Harvey used to say, you know, you, the rest of the story. You've got to get the whole thing. If you're here this morning and not a child of God before He's the opportunity, believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, to repent of your sin, confess your belief, be baptized into Christ, walk in a newness of life. Or as a child of God, not walking where you ought to be through repentance and prayer, you can find reconciliation. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Hear the invitation, whosoever will. Come, hear the invitation, whosoever will. Praise God for full salvation, whosoever will. For whosoever will. All things are ready. Come to the feast, come for the door is open wide. A place of honor is reserved for you at the Master's side. Hear the invitation, whosoever will. Come, hear the invitation, whosoever will. Praise God for full salvation, whosoever For whosoever will. All things are ready, come to the feast. Come while he waits to welcome thee. Delay not while this day is thine, tomorrow may never be. Hear the invitation, whosoever will. Come, hear the invitation, whosoever will. Praise God for full salvation, whosoever will. For whosoever will. All things are ready. Come to the feast, leave every care and worldly strife. Come feast upon the love of God, and drink everlasting life. Hear the invitation, whosoever will. Come, hear the invitation, whosoever will. Praise God for full salvation, whosoever for whosoever will. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.